This episode of the Check Out This Cast is brought to you by GuitarExclusive.com. Visit now for buying guides, reviews, and more. GuitarExclusive.com. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Rock, Rock, Rock and Roll Podcast. Check out this record. My name is Frank, and with me is my good buddy, Mark. Hey, Frank. Hello, listeners. You can find us, hey, Mark, on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music Podcasts, and you can see these mugs on YouTube. That's right. That's my face and Frank's face. We release new episodes each and every Friday, so you can listen to something cool as fuck, while you ignore your boss during that lame meeting, you know he's going to make you attend later on. That totally could have just been a fucking email. Oh my God. <laughs> oh, that's so fitting based on our conversations. Anyway, so if you're hearing this for the first time, you're probably uh, not annoyed with one of our past reviews. Um, so hopefully, you know, but those are. Yeah, great. Right, exactly. You made it this far. We review records. We go track by track, baby. We have a lot of musical discussions. We do spotlight episodes, which might even include some mysteries. Uh, we've only scratched the surface here, and we're just getting warmed up. Right, Mark? You know, be sure to check out our verse series where we pit two bands or albums or songs against each other and make them duke it out for total stereo domination. See, now, feedback I've gotten is that's where we go, total nerd, and I love it. I love mm -hmm. it. Everyone's mm -hmm. like, that total stereo domination stuff is just complete nerd, and I'm like, yep. Applause all the way. Yeah, whatever. F you, nerd. <laughs> <laughs> Be sure to check us out on Instagram and the Facebook group. Hopefully, these episodes, hopefully, will leave you wanting more of our musical goodness. And that guy... Right there is random nonsense. And of course, if you have a record you want us to check out, drop a comment wherever you find us, like, subscribe, and give us a review. So, Mark, I'm going to say this. Konas Atatu. Living that best life, Franco. Uh, what have you been up to this week? <laughs> well, as you can tell, Mark, I'm brushing up on my Gaelic. And ah, that's what that was. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Didn't probably sound like it at all. but Not at all. Not at all. Not at all. Uh, <laughs> And for good reason, because, Mark, I've been bothering you about the Pogues since we started this whole venture. I mean, the very first episode where I gave you the first Replacements album, uh, the intention was the first Pogues album, actually, in the beginning. Uh, and then we, we just did a little uh, switch ski there. Uh, so here we are. Obviously, listen, Jersey's least favorite son, Bon Jovi, uh, poked me enough. Mm -hmm. uh, with this puke infested version of the fairy tale of New York to want me to revisit. Um, and I think the second album is actually a great place to dive right into Mark. So mm -hmm. um, as we always do, what, what was your first experience with the Pogues outside of maybe me just yapping about it too? Yeah. There's been a lot of you yapping about it. Um, I know the Pogues have been around for, for so long. It's kind of hard to say. Um, I wasn't shy about being into like dropkick Murphy's and flogging Molly. But I guess I never really questioned where that kind of traditional Irish folk sound and the, and the punk hybrid came together. Um, you know, I have a pretty bad habit of just going like, hey, that was cool and not not figuring out where those things came into. And that's what I love about this show is that you and I get to dive in and, and really figure out where these sounds and styles came from. So All that's... Right. <laughs> Ooh, noises. Um, you know... <laughs> So the, the bulk of the signs, Frank, are, are pointing uh, right here, uh, you know, in terms of where that sound came from. There you go. Right back to the Pogues. And um, so I'm, I'm pretty excited because, like, it was it was just an, as soon as we put this on, and we'll, we'll get into it, I was oh, like, oh, yeah. of course this is the inspiration for all of that. <laughs> right. Um, you know, so what, what about you? How were you first uh, exposed to the Pogues? Which I kind of like the way that rhymes. Yeah, I, I do like that a lot. It just sounds nice. It's very soothing on the ears. Exposed to the pose. Yeah, that's good. Good. It sounds a little bit like an STD, but it's cool. <laughs> there you go. Like most, I would say it's Fairy Tale of New York. But I, as I was getting into Dropkick Murphys and Flogging Molly, I kept getting directed to the Pogues as the fathers of this genre, the the Celtic folk punk and well mark you you know how much I like genre mashups, right? Yeah. So I so I went right in. So. 
yo, let's let's do it. You want a little history of this band, shall we? You know, I um, I've got me a whiskey drink. Yes, you do. Uh, and I will say that the whiskey goes up to about the middle of the G, so I'm nice. really prepared for tonight. Um, I'm gonna wet my whistle. Why don't you uh, get us started? And and for those of you who who can't see, uh, uh, this is a very hefty Flanagan's cup. And yes, if you're not a- from South Florida, you don't know what Flanagan's cups are. Right. But trust me, it's a very large glass of whiskey with a little yeah. ginger ale in it. I like ginger <laughs> and whiskey. <laughs> it's a great cup. It's a great cup. So yeah. listen, this Celtic punk is is the mashup we're talking about here, and the Pogues really are where this begins. So the the genre is basically Irish or Scottish traditional music mixed with punk, right? It, it's Irish music on steroids. Basically, we get everything from bagpipes, fiddles, flutes, accordions, mandolins, and banjos. So we have traditional Celtic folk. We have a traditional Celtic folk band that added rock like the Dubliners and the Clancy Brothers, who were big bands uh, in in the 80s um, and obviously prior to that as well. Um, But in the early 80s in London, we have Shane McGowan and we have Spider Stacy. They began to experiment with what would become the Pogue sound. Uh, They would take traditional Irish folk songs and play them in a punk style. Uh, in addition to McGowan and Stacy, they were joined by James Fernley on accordion, Jem Finner on banjo, Kate O'Riordan on bass, and Andrew Rankin on drums. So after going through a few names, they settled on the Pogues and they started to gain some attention, especially when they opened for the Clash Mark in ni- on their 1984 tour, uh, which is yeah. pretty that is pretty cool, and I'd like to add, I'm so happy you had to say the names and not me. Thank you. There you go. <laughs> so later that year, they released their first album, Red Roses for Me, and the album had a great video of the traditional Irish tune, Waxy's Dargle. And, and in that video, you have Spider Stacy repeatedly smashing himself in the head with a beer tray, uh, which is pretty funny. So I, I encourage everyone to go and check out that um that video so then we get the follow-up to this record which is the one on deck tonight so it's rum sodomy and the lash all right guitarist philip chevron joined the band and mark elvis costello produced this right which is really kind of also what made it attractive to us to review because mark and i have just a undying love for for elvis costello so part of the attraction of this record you like what i did there i did i did yeah People, people who aren't obsessed with Elvis and stuff, Costello like us yeah. are going, what the fuck are these idiots talking about? <laughs> <laughs> it's telling you, man. So the title is a quote taken from Winston Churchill when he said, don't talk to me about naval tradition. It's nothing but rum, sodomy, and the lash. So that's where that title comes from. And the album cover is based on the raft of the Medusa, which is a romantic era painting by, I'm going to screw up this name, Theodore Garrocult. Sure. Sorry if I mispronounced that. So upon the release of this album, it received very positive reviews. It was slower speed style wise than the first album, but very dark in tone and super gritty, uh, which would be attributed to Costello producing it, at least my assumption of that. Um, We get a real emphasis here on McGowan's vocals, which on some tombs focuses you to concentrate on that aspect more than the actual music. Uh, In retrospect, this album is regarded as one of the Pogue's best and uh, even though those lists are questionable, Mark, that we, all, that we always talked about, it's ranked 440 on Rolling Stone's greatest 500 albums of all time. Uh, Pitchfork Media named it the 67th best album of the 80s. And the album is in the book of 1001 albums you need to hear before you die. So yeah. it's just it's pretty crazy, right? So without going too much into detail, because we're, we're getting there soon, Mark, you put this thing on. What's your first impressions of this? Yeah, my first impression of this was a simple one. Well, I, I'll need to be drinking while we listen to this. <laughs> so I, I saved it for uh, a day after work. You know, that, that was a must, you know. So fast forward a few hours and, and a few drinks. Um, there is a, a warmth to the tone of this record, despite its darkness. That feels a bit like like the end of a night at a pub or a club after get just like a great live show, and the staff is cleaning up and you're just like dragging yourself and a buddy out to the to the back seat of your car to sleep off all the drinks you just had, the great times you just had. Nice. Um, you know, you're in the back seat, just trying to remember those songs that you were just singing. The whiskey is just still all over your face and your shirt and your breath. 
Um, <laughs> and you, you just loved sharing that moment and, and the awesomeness of it. And you really get that from, the, from this record. And that was kind of my first impression was just that, that feeling of being struck in the face by a sound of, of happiness from going to a concert. You know, I know, I know yeah. we're all starved for live music these days. Um, this just had that, like, that feeling when you, when you finish listening to it, where you're like, you're catching your breath a little bit of like, yeah, whoa, wh whoa. And that, that, it was just, look, I'm not saying you wouldn't have had that experience without the alcohol. Um, if you don't want to drink, that's up to you. Um, however, I thought it was an absolutely phenomenal, just great experience. Very, very salt of the earth, you know, floor of the pub kind of feel to it. Awesome, man. Awesome. So hey. I, I'm so stoked that we, we finally get the chance now for you to, to go into it in detail and let's do the track by track review of Rum Sodomy and the Lash. And this is the original release, not the reissue, which has of course, extra tracks. And on a side note, includes a poem uh, about the Pogues by Tom Waits, which is, which is pretty cool. And I'll get to, I'll circle back around to that at, at the end, but so let's get going, Mark, take, take us away, my friend. Absolutely. The sick bed of Kukulin. I probably said that wrong. No, it's I think it's Kukulin. I love this like low rumbling drum and mandolin intro. And then uh, you get Mag McGowan. Yeah. His voice just nice and low. Just he's as raspy as he can be. Totally. Uh, where the band just starts ramping it up and, and the song just takes off. Um, I hate to sound like like too cliche about the pub thing here, but I, I really just want to be holding a beverage and like above my head and singing this. Yeah. In a shitty little pub until my lungs hurt with Frank and you know, like arms. Oh, arms yeah. It just has that feel to it. And and I promise I'll try to stop being so cliche about this record going forward. But like, <laughs> this, this is such like a, hey, get ready. We're sitting here and we're 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 standing here and singing every song. Feel to it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I and I absolutely love this as the opening track. Uh, Cucullin is an Irish mythological uh, mythological demigod, which I'm I'm intrigued with. Uh, musically, this picks up where the first record leaves off, but it, but it's more mature, and I think the production value ha has to do with that. Um, all of McGowan's vices are on full display here, uh, as what he sang about, and and really, I mean, he's the type where what he sang about, he he probably did so it's it's legit um and he's got the gift of when he sings i believe him here without any doubt so uh just a wonderful tune to get to get started um number two the old main drag uh it's been a highlight for me on this album uh, every time i listen to it brutally sad lyrics and equally sad music it's a piece of poetry it tells the story of a 16 year old boy arriving on the streets of london and becoming a, a sex addict right mcgowan really wanted to paint the the picture of life living on the streets uh, of london uh, which included sex work uh drug use violence uh death it's super tragic but man I just love when stuff like this is turned into a killer tune. Mark, how how did you feel about this this tune? Yeah, what's wild about this tune is that as you listen to it, it feels like he's spinning you a yarn, right? He's spinning right. You this, this tale and, and you know about you know it, it couldn't really be about him and how shitty dreams turn out to be. Um, and you know it's just so somber and morose that that by the end you you do. Frank's right. You absolutely believe him because it sounds so absurd, but it he doesn't let it go. It's so nagging and so, so painful that you, you really believe him. You know, above all else, this song is a, a beautiful tribute to how sad our, our horrible world can be. Yeah. Um, but, but done in a very uh, beautifully, beautiful way. I know it's right. hard to say like, hey, this song's uh, about how shitty life is, but it's gorgeous. Um, but yeah, it's gorgeous. It is, so. it is, it really is. <laughs> So um, the next track is The Wildcats Kilkenny. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of be beautiful tributes, this instrumental feels like the band paying tribute to their heritage, but also uh, only the way they would dare to do so. Um, I love the name of it and how, how untraditional this traditional song is. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, it's an instrumental that makes me jump with the screams in the beginning. I'm always like, ah, you know, <laughs> uh, but, but it's, even though it's not a traditional tune as in the sense where the band, this is a, a original composition. It sounds like something from centuries ago too, which is, which is really cool how they they've taken that and, and made it their own. 
Um, and, and it's a cool instrumental. Absolutely. Um, the next song is I'm the Man You Don't Meet Every Day, uh, sang by a bassist, uh, Kate O. Riordan, uh, who would eventually leave the band after um, after this album as she married Elvis Costello. <laughs> so she after this, she's no longer in the band. Uh, haunting vocals, just a great performance. And this is an old traditional Irish song, man, that cuts you to the core. I, I really do enjoy this track. What about you? Yeah, I love Kate's performance here. Her ver- her voice, excuse me, is is regal and feels oh, uh, absolutely timeless. Uh, I'm a sucker for a good old gender switch song where a woman sings from a man's uh, point of view. Right. Uh, playing with the idea of what do these words mean that are supposed to be coming from a man, but a woman is singing them? What What does that context mean? What does it change? What does it say about uh, the man? you don't meet every day it's a really interesting idea and beautifully done um you know is it about him or about her either way she does a stunning job singing it the band is really beautiful here yeah um track five a pair of brown eyes uh this is like a uh, dylan level shit right here man <laughs> like the song structure and lyrics are are so simple yet so powerful that I'd be damned if we could reproduce them or create these on our own with and get this effect and it still be this beautiful and simple. Yeah. Um, you know, a, a simple tale of being told a tale in a pub, right? So it's, yes, we're going to get, I, I think Frank's going to talk about the, the nitty gritty of what the story is. But really the idea here is that it's, it's somebody talking about a story they're being told. So right. it's, it's a really interesting point of view. It's so like, dude, this is such Dylan level shit. It's fucking amazing. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the effect it has on both the listener and the storyteller. It's really just so cool. A uh, really powerful song, Frank. Yeah. It, it, this was a single from the album. And obviously it's one of the most popular tunes uh, in their uh, catalog. Uh, a video was made for the song and it features a cameo by Costello, which is cool. And the jukebox Johnny that's mentioned in the song is a reference to Johnny Cash, which is even cooler. Uh, it's about someone at the pub and is approached by a veteran who tells the person about military life and how his beloved brown eyes were the things that kept him going uh, that person then leaves the pub drinking and thinking about his own lost love who guess what had a pair of brown eyes i mean like like mark said this is dylan shit right here very very well done very well done speaking of well done track six sally mac Lillane. i always feel i want to say like jack Lillane. remember jack Lillane, the juicer guy that guy who sure. lived till like he was 90 for some reason. Is, that you, is that you dead <laughs> I think so, man. Maybe next week where we find out if that dude's dead or not. Uh, I'm well, not Googling it right now. I'm too drunk. <laughs> not that drunk. I just don't feel like Googling it. I, I think he, he died, just for the record, in uh, 2011. So. Oh. But he was also born in 1914, so he was 96. <laughs> yeah, stay tuned next week when we do a tribute to Jack McClellan. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so... Bastard. Anyway, Sally McLean is another single from the album. It's a type of stout, and this song is another staple in the band's catalog. Another great job of storytelling by McGowan and his love of fear with stout and the drink is on full display. Obviously, if you see interviews with him today, you could know that, <laughs> that he had a love for the drink. Super catchy tune. It will leave you, as Mark said uh, you know, a couple of tunes ago, just wanting to drink and sing all day long, Mark. Absolutely. Fuck. Uh, I wish I honestly, I, I wish I had this song for every funeral I've ever been to. Like, play this, Frank. Look at me. Look at me. Yes. Play this at my funeral. Uh, you, everyone's heard it. Yeah. Um, this is this is more than a song about a good stat. This is this is a song about saying goodbye and being in, as Irish as possible about it. I, I love it. It, it. This is hands down my favorite track on the song. It, do yourself a favor, put this on, pull up the lyrics and, and just get into it. It's so beautifully done that that circle of life, that classic Irish storytelling of a boy being born in a pub, watching people die, watching that one guy who got away come back just to die. Fucking amazing. Yeah. Brilliant. Fucking amazing. Brilliant. Um, it, absolutely. The, the, it, the song stole my heart. Absolutely endeared me to the band. Like probably forever. Um <laughs> That said, track seven, yes, a for Patty Garcia. Probably Garcia, right? I don't know. I'm just assuming because they're Irish that it's not Garcia, but whatever. Anyways, 
Uh, I think that's the actual title. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm just like, I don't know if the Irish have, like, they did like, Garcia. I don't know. <laughs> um, anyways, I love the, the long titles for instrumental tracks. Like, it's just so fucking cool to me. Why are we giving Patty Garcia a pistol? What is it about Western cowboy flicks uh, and, and traditional Irish folk tunes that go so damn well together? It, oh, oh, my God. Cool. Brilliant. Uh, you know, the we've been talking a lot about you know, the singing on this record and how great it is. And, and what's cool with the two instrumental tracks is we really get to experience the range and depth that the band has um, and just not pigeonholing them to being just an Irish fan because they really stretch out what that means and what that sound really can be for themselves. Um, you know, I, I just, I think it's a cool tune. It, it's a definitely a fun little, uh, little instrumental kind of tucked away, which leads nicely into the next track frank yeah no absolutely and and this is you know it, it this tune was the instrumental was penned by the banjo player and it, and it's it, it's great kind of if you like us and like to listen to records it, once these instrumental songs come on and you're doing stuff say around the house for example it, it's great to have that going on and to me it even sounds a little bit more modern than the wild cats tune that we heard earlier but again they, they're able to put their own twist on these things which is great um, the next track is dirty old town uh this is an old uh, irish folk tune written by uh ewan mccall um and it's it has a country shuffle beat to it for sure with that Irish flair. It's interesting how these Irish influence records tend to have quite a bit uh, of covers, which I'm sure is because they want to keep true to the roots. So it, it does make sense. And, and a lot of people haven't heard these songs. So if, if you can make them your own again, that makes sense to me. I don't mind the song. It could be one I, I skip from time to time, but it's still a good track. And that's Dirty Old Town. Yeah, I, I really love how you get this like kind of shift in sound and tone from the last few tracks. We're really well into the record at this point. And, and what Rum Sodomy and The Lash is, is still kind of a mystery if, you, if Frank hadn't told you what it was up front, right? Right. Because the album's not really giving you any clues. And I love the way this track just kind of makes you go like, what the fuck is this record about? <laughs> like, it's just, kind of, it's just really kind of cool like that because we're really getting all these feels uh, from all over the place. And it's very cool, um, you know, in that way. You know, I'm getting kind of like a window into the band's collective mind as to, to where they were and, and how this whole thing came together with tunes like this because you're hearing some of that influence, right? Some of that, yeah. some of that pulling of, of what they know and what's part of them, you know? It's, it's like you and me putting This Land Is Your Land on a record and, and some kid in India finds it and he's like, what is this track? It's fucking amazing. Like I wasn't trying to do an Indian voice. That was just me being silly. Um, so I just thought it was really cool. I, I really appreciate it. I thought it was well done. Um, yeah, pretty cool. Track number nine is Jesse James. Jesse James. All that I have to say is that I did not expect a tribute to <laughs> Jesse James coming. I did not see this coming. Uh, I'm sure that there, there would be a ton of fun in a pub uh, to sing along, but I, I don't know that it adds as much to this album as, as many of the other tracks. It's cool, but probably the low light for me yeah i mean what's crazy is you have this this album and the uh, the traditional tunes are these irish tunes and this is a rendition of a classic american folk song about you guessed it jesse james right and i always find that the american outlaws um in these songs just the, the topic would be very very fascinating but but you also don't have any shane here on vocals i believe this is spire stacy it's nothing crazy with regards to innovate uh, innovation it's a cool song but i can see where mark's coming from where you're like well what is Jesse James had to do a rum sodomy in the lash. <laughs> you know, it'd be like, if you told me, oh, this was a B-side for one of the singles, I'd be like, okay, that's like a, a fun, weird B-side to mess with people. Right, right. Yeah. But also like, if they just kind of came out with this in the middle of a set and you're, you're in a pub or you're in a club seeing them, that would have been really cool. Like, what the fuck is this song about Jesse James? It just feels a little odd and clunky on this right. record. I, and maybe that's just me. Sure, sure. Well, track 10 is Navigator, and uh, this is written by uh, Phil Gaston, who is the manager of McGowan's first band. He wrote this song for the Pogues, and the Navigators were laborers uh, employed to work on construction projects in the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries. Uh, just due to the even-keeled nature uh, of the album, it's probably uh, another one that I that I skip from time to time. But, you know, it's it's not one where I'm like, oh, this is a horrible song. But, yeah, I would say it's still kind of in that in that period for me. What about you? 
Yeah, I, I thought this was a wonderful tribute to the, the men who gave their lives uh, to progress and capitalism by working from sunrise to sunset. My left sure. is Many of whom died uh, in the service, um, as McGowan sings, were buried uh, where their bodies fell under, uh, in unmarked graves, um, you know, just to save the entrepreneurs some brass in their pockets, as he says. Uh, it's an interesting comment on the morality of doing business in a rapidly growing and uncaring world, right? I, this is something uh, Frank and I had a side conversation about a few days ago, the morality of business. Oh, yeah. It's so interesting how it kind of came up here. And the other thing that I'm seeing, right, is that like we got the earlier story about the soldier telling the story about his brown eyed girl. And now we're seeing the story of these guys who passed away building the infrastructure of the country. Yeah. Really an interesting, you know, the, the shape of this album, what they're trying to do is starting to, to mold better together a little bit. Um, and you really feel that in the next tune, Billy's Bones. Yeah. Um, you know, so we go from the graves of laborers to the graves of soldiers, right? We're really building that connection. Um, you know, Billy's grave, there, there would uh, appear to be a universal innocence of the young men that go to war on behalf of the world's governments, right? And, uh, and that's really what they're kind of setting up in the beginning of the song with Billy, really, right? Selling that, like the kind of carefree soldier aspect back in the day, um, you know, but then they balance that with the grief of Billy's mother as Billy's never coming home again and, and what that means, um, you know? So it's a really interesting balance when that son never comes home and we, we get to feel both ends of that, like that innocence and that weight of grief, you know, it's really interesting, really heavy tune. Uh, dressed up as a drink pumping pub song. I, I, this song's awesome. Yeah, I mean, it's a short and fun tune and, and it's an original tune. So this is not a traditional Irish folk tune of that that has that's dealing with that nature too. So this is something that they wrote. It captures again that, that Celtic punk sound that they laid the foundation from on the first album. I really like it. And as you were just explaining it earlier, Mark, too, I think this is maybe in maybe even though those songs weren't our favorites, maybe the past couple that we just talked about, this is maybe that point when you're listening to this as a long play album where those lights go off and you're like, oh, Rum Sodomy and the Lash, this is where everything kind of fits in uh, yeah. and, and starts taking form. So, um, and that's a cool point when albums could do that to people. So uh, it's pretty cool. And then we go into this other song, The Gentleman's Sol Soldier. It's another, <laughs> right. I mean, it's another oh, traditional no. tune uh, that that really sounds like the, though they must have had fun though recording it. There's lots of like funny voices that act as characters, which is again gives it a different perspective. Kind of like when Cato Riordan sang her uh, tune. Uh, it's a funny. It, it, it's it's a fun kind of nature tune in the pub. Obviously, the the content's probably a little bit more serious than that. But I I, I enjoyed the tune. What about you, Mark? See, it, it's funny. Uh, usually I'm the one who takes songs too seriously. I don't think this one's all that serious, although we are still talking about soldiers going off to war, right? This right. Feel like it would be a, a great song for a sing-along in, in, in an old-fashioned pub, uh, 100%. You know, um, a fling, if you will, between a soldier and, and quote-unquote Polly um, before he leaves for war, only to reveal that he's already married. And right. And lie about the fact that they had this affair anyway. <laughs> Um, you know, it's it's cute for what it is. Um, it's not a highlight in the album for sure, but it's definitely an interesting, um, you know, kind of pin to put in this record about what we're saying about uh, the people who are willing to sacrifice their lives for us and, and the things that happen um, with their nature. It's get more of that carefree, like, oh, it's just a soldier going to war. Let's show him a good time. Right, um, right, right. Really, really beautiful. And then, of course, um, you know, Frank, I think this is where you and I have the argument over what the best song of the album is. <laughs> because we get to, and the band played Waltzing Matilda. You I mean, know, it's I, crazy. It, it's, uh, I have to tell you, this doesn't feel eight minutes long at all. Normally, Frank and I would stop the show absolutely dead right here to bitch about how long this fucking song is. But not today. Nope. I mean, even though I just did it. The Pogues use every moment of this song's eight minute length to tell this tale in a manner of pure perfection. There is no other way to tell this tale and for it to have the impact that it does. It needs to be this slow. It needs to have this pacing and timing. To balance the horrors of war with Waltz and Matilda is sublime. The freedom of putting on a bag and just, and just seeing the world and taking yourself wherever your legs will carry you only to go 
serve your country, to, to give all you can for your fellow man to return without your legs and to never be able to Oof. walk Matilda, which is, for those of you who don't know what that means, it's Oof. Australian slang for backpacking and, right. and a traditional thing that young men would do. They'd throw on a backpack and they'd go see their world. They'd go explore Australia and come back and, and then they'd become men kind of thing, you know, like whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so that balance, that, that storytelling, you know, the imagery of the parade and what is it going to mean when nobody else is marching there? Like, so beautiful. Absolutely beautiful song. Yeah. I mean, there's this, this a song by a gentleman named Eric Bogle and it describes, of course, war and the, uh, and the gruesome territory that comes with it. It's an account of an Australian serviceman who is, who's maimed during the war. Uh, they're emotionally devastated uh, by the loss of his legs. Uh, it's a powerful tune. Rum sodomy and the lash. Yeah, you know, that's that's how you end the album. And Mark's right, doesn't feel like eight minutes at all, at all, because that's the first thing we would have bitched about, <laughs> and we and we didn't. So, I mean, but it was something we needed to address, right? Because it is something we say a lot, like, "Oh my God, did that song need to be eight minutes?" Yes, yes, yeah. this song needed to be eight minutes. This is, and I'm going to get to it in a minute because Frank's going to do his final thoughts first. Oh, thank you. This is Dylan level shit. Yeah. Yeah, and, this and that's it right. Needs to be treated as such. Yeah, and I and I and I have no gripe on the the Dylan you know storytelling songs that are eight minutes long. Um, it's more so the Red Hot Chili Peppers ones when they do <laughs> stuff like that. Anyway, so final thoughts on the album. <laughs> Go on. I know, I know. Final thoughts. There, there was a YouTube comment I think on the Chili Peppers yeah episode where they're like, "I'm sorry, you have shitty taste in music." <laughs> and I'm like, "All right, well." <laughs> I'm sorry your taste is stuck in 1994 and you can't own that that record's not good. Well, my reply was, tell me, I was like, sorry for, you know, that we have different views than you do, but I said, uh, tell me what you feel was then good about it, and I never got a reply, so there you go. But he zinged you. He zinged you. I won. (laughs) So final thoughts of the album. So I mentioned Tom Pate's, uh, Tom Waits penned a poem earlier, but he also stated this on the album. Uh, Sometimes when things are real, some excuse me let me start over sometimes when things are real flat you want to hear something flat other times you just want to project onto it something more like you want to hear the pogues because they love the west they love the old movies that thing about ireland the idea that you could get into a car and point it towards california and drive it for the next five days is like euphoria because in ireland you can get you could keep going around in circles those tiny little roads dirty old town the old main drag shane has a gift i believe him he knows how to tell the story there are roaring stumbling band these are dead end kids for real shane's voice conveys so much they play like soldiers on leave. The songs are epic. It's whimsical and blasphemous, seasick and sacrilegious. Wear it out and get another one. Uh, I mean, that's a great way to describe the album, right? And obviously Tom Waits is a master of, of putting these things together. And you have yeah. Costello at the producing helm here. I, I was always curious as to as sometimes how this album ended up with the tone as early Costello had all this energy. But this is 1984. And by 85, it, Costello would have released his King of America album. So it, to me, it, it makes it, it makes a lot of sense. And I sometimes go back and forth where there's days where I'm like, okay, well, you know, maybe these tunes, some of them maybe could have been even more Celtic punk sound, but it was so new at the time. So maybe they were still trying to figure stuff out here on album, only album number two. Um, I, without a doubt, think it's a classic. It's gritty. It, it bears a really cold darkness that the band and, of course, Shane's vocals capture. Uh, I think the next album, If I Should Fall from the Grace or God, um, might be more complete where they're re- where they're really refining that Celtic punk sound. And that's what you hear in Floggy Molly and Dropkick. And that's how they came to be. However, listen, this album showed uh, that they were more than just a band that liked Irish tunes and wanted to play them really fast. Uh, with that said, overall. To me, it's an eight out of five out of ten. It's a beautiful record. What, what, what about you? Yeah, I couldn't agree with uh, Mr. Waits or yourself anymore, Frank. Uh, this was a, a great album to really dig into as an introduction for the band, right? We're not pulling any punches with this record. You're getting all of it. Um, it's got amazing heart and depth. It stinks of snuffed out cigarettes and spilled beer, and it's all the better for it. 
Uh, maybe those are cliches, but you know what? The, this album's the reason those cliches exist. It's so fucking good. Yeah. Uh, the album is full of both life and death. It celebrates and recoils in fear from both uh, with great care and, and reckless abandon. Um, oh. You know, this is, I, I think you're right. The, the eight and a half, almost nine mm-hmm. uh, out of 10 rating. My only real criticisms are the Jesse James tune. Um, was altogether, uh, I would say, unnecessary. Um, not that it was bad, rather that it, it just didn't fit in or add much value in terms of the way the album was going. Right. And um, the old main drag, while a, a powerful tune and the message, uh, music, uh, the message and musically, it, it's it's a stretch for that second uh, song slot. It's a little hard at that second tune. I wasn't sure why it wasn't the closer on the first listen. And then, of course, I got to Waltz and Matilda, and I understand why that's the closer, <laughs> right? But I feel like there could have been, and this is just me nitpicking and being a fat guy on the internet, right? Um, <laughs> you know, if we had scrapped Jesse James and put the old main drag between A Pistol for Patty and Dirty Old Town, I think that would have been tits. Yeah. Um, I think it, it, the flow would have just been a little bit smoother. That said... The fuck do I know? Eight and a half out of ten. Amazing record. Um, we'll definitely be picking this up as soon as I can find it in a record shop. And Frank will tell you last night I found it in a record shop. I <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say news update. And I agree with you with the flow. I mean, like I could have totally taken like the Wildcats instrumental even as the second tune, you know? Um, and then the kind of well, that would have been a cool opener. Well, yeah, Open but, the record with that scream. <laughs> Right. Yeah, exactly. It definitely jolts you. That's for sure. And uh, Mark will be picking that up. So uh, I'm amped for him on that. And so, Mark, we've been talking about this Irish style music and it's it's time for the top 10. Now we're going to do our favorite Irish musician slash bands not named you two or, or the Pogues. Yeah. And, and I know he's of Irish descent, but we're going to omit Elvis Costello, too, because I'm sure he's our you know, he's up there for us. Uh, so since it's more narrow this time. Um, and again, we're omitting you too. Uh, let's split it up five and five, my friend. How does that sound? Absolutely. You want to go first? Or you want me to? Uh, you pick. <laughs> um, hold on, let me see who you guys. I'm going to let. Oh, fuck. I fucked that up. Um, I'm <laughs> going to let you go first. Okay. That sounds good. That sounds good. Okay. So here we go. No particular order. Well, no, actually, there, it is an order, but I just ordered it wrong on my on my sheet okay so the first one i have up is uh damien rice if you're into indie folk uh damien rice is a guy worth checking out his first album oh came out in 2002 uh it's a great little record again if you like those indie folk vibes uh he's a talented songwriter damien rice uh that's that's the the first one on my list what about you mark yeah first one on my list um the boomtown rats boomtown rats but wait I'm going to pull a Frank here. Honorable mention to a band called The Number Ones. They're an Irish punk band. Um, excuse me, Irish rock band with a, with a good old punk edge um, that put out a fantastic album in 2014 called The Number Ones. What? Uh, <laughs> it's totally worth your time. Check it out. Anyways, Boomtown Rats. Most people know their singer, Bob Geldof, as Pink from Pink Floyd's The Wall. Right. Um, or for helping to organize things like Band-Aids. Uh, in the 80s, but they don't know that he fronted the the Boomtown Rats, a a new wave band that had a kind of great punk energy, but made some cool tunes like uh, I Don't Like Mondays. Uh, They were far from, uh, far more successful in the UK than they were here in the US, but check them out. There's there's some gems in there that you might really dig. Cool, cool. And I thought you were going to say Gandalf when you were saying Bob Gildalf. <laughs> yeah, it's close. <laughs> it's close. It's close. All right. The next one for me is the Water Boys. It's another band that really flies under the radar. They have been belting out tunes since 1983, and they've done everything from post-punk, alternative rock, Celtic, folk. Uh, their second album, A Pagan Place, is the one I tend to gravitate to. So if you have some time, they have a big extensive catalog. Check out the Water Boys. Yeah. My next one, stay tuned for uh, Frank's addendum, is Them. Uh, this is the band that kickstarted Van Morrison's career. Founded, them. Yeah, Them. T H E M. Yeah. Founded in 1964, Belfast, Ireland, 
The group had a few charting singles included Baby Please Don't Go, Here Comes the Night, and Gloria, the latter uh, song ending up on Van Morrison's debut album. Uh, what can I say? They, that is them, gave us a lot of great tunes and set us up for, you know, one of the best blue-eyed soul acts the world has ever known. Yeah. Yeah. And so. thank you for giving that one to me so I could chat about it. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, it's all good, man. The Dubliners, they're next. I mentioned them earlier. Um, they were formed in 1962. Listen, they've had a long-lasting career with being active all the way up to 2012. They're probably one of the first, I would say, bands to bring the traditional Irish music to the popular masses, which obviously influenced then bands like the Pogues to take it a step further. So the Dubliners, that's next on my list. Very nice. Mine is uh, Stiff Little Fingers. Uh, mm -hmm. easily Ireland's best known punk band based on me pulling that out of my ass. Uh, no, I don't <laughs> think there's a more Irish punk band uh, than Stiff Little Fingers, unless you want to argue the Pogues, but different conversation. Uh, the group makes crunchy anthematic singles that, that beg for raised fists and, and shouted chorus. Uh, amazingly, the band is, is still kicking, mm -hmm. albeit with, you know, the majority of the original lineup. Um, <laughs> Anyways, uh, the songs sound uh, potent even decades later. Really great band. If you haven't checked them out, they're what gave us Green Day, Stiff Little Finger. Yeah, and go watch High Fidelity where there's a scene that explains that whole thing. <laughs> yep. Next is, everyone knows them, I think, Flog and Molly. I mean, it's an obvious choice here. Dave King was in the hard rock band Fastway in the 80s. Uh, so your metalheads or um hair metal people might know of dave king and they may not know of flogging molly which is which is pretty uh, interesting and since 1997 he's fronted the insanely popular flogging molly i mean they're they're huge so um flogging molly yeah uh for me my my number two pick your number two whatever uh is the cranberries uh, you and i both know the impact zombie had on the world from 1993 through 1994 it was walking everywhere 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 um, i definitely had uh the album no need to argue on uh on compact disc back in the day Ooh, uh, and i was in love with it uh back then when i had it put it on uh while i was making this list and i gotta tell you still bangs but salvation is on that uh album too right i believe so there you go that was a that was a head rocker mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Number one, uh, Mark mentioned him earlier, Van Morrison. I mean, listen, if Astral Weeks was the only thing he ever did, uh, he would still be better than half the musicians and the bands out there. The guy is completely fascinating. He writes amazing tunes, one hell of a voice. We'll probably have to do an episode on him at some point. Van Morrison, that's mine. And I'm kind of vamped about Mark to talk so you can talk about it. Let's go ahead. <laughs> yeah, on a Van Morrison note, before we get too far into it, if you read or listen to the Elvis Costello autobiography, Yes. He has the funniest stories about just running into Van Morrison on the street and them going to a recording session and Van Morrison just disappearing. <laughs> it's really fucking cool. Anyways, <laughs> uh, number one, uh, Thin Lizzy. Uh, Frank was kind enough to leave Thin Lizzy for me to talk about, and I thank him yeah. for that. Uh, dude, they ruled, and I think we'll need to do a little something here uh, on the band in a coming episode because when you get past the boys are back in town and, and jailbreak, which are awesome singles, great songs, huge songs, and they're phenomenal. Uh, you get this amazing rock band that mastered the twin guitar attack paired with these working class uh, sentiments. It, it really just drives home. Like this is the best of seventies rock. Right. And it pushed so many different genres. They rode that kind of motorhead cusp of yeah. rock and, and punk rock. They could do like the, the good old fashioned classic rock sound. They, they did it all. Really amazing band. Um, you know, time loves to, to underrate these guys. And I think, you know, um, not on that, this podcast, bitches. We, we think Thin Lizzy rules, and, uh, or at least I do. I'm going to get Frank to agree with that uh, in the coming weeks. Stay yes. tuned for, uh, for Thin Lizzy coming up. What we do, Frank and I still have to figure that out, but you, you will definitely be into it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and I and I can't wait just to get uh, into it and um, quality of a band, quality of a band, and now we get to the next episode, Mark. So who know who knew that Ireland could rock so hard, Mark? We did. That's right, Frank. 
We're not just a couple of good looking chumps. We know our rock and roll too, baby. Yes. What do you want to do next week? Well, Mark, you remember how uh, we did that self-titled Foo Fighters album a couple weeks back? Oh, son of a bitch. There's a new Foo Fighters record, isn't there? <laughs> bingo, bango, my friendo. Medicine at Midnight is releasing this week. So you and me are going to have to listen to this. And hopefully we don't hate it, my friend. Okay, but I'm not going to promise I won't hate it. <laughs> I don't think I've liked anything that uh, I've heard so far. Because uh, they've, they've released a few singles. Uh this episode probably going to drop the day that album drops, if I'm remembering correctly. So when you guys hear us talking shit about Foo Fighters and an album we haven't heard yet, know that we're listening to it right now. <laughs> and then we're talking shit about it via text message to each other. Oh my God. It's going to be pretty, uh, it's going to be entertaining, but um, yeah, we're, we're going to see. We're going to see. So uh, I'm, I'm excited though. Let's, let's listen to it. Clean slate. Let's see how they are sounding in 2021. And um, I'm ready, man. I'm ready. So, Mark, uh, why don't you uh, you want to say goodbye to those kids at home? Fine. <laughs> Thanks for listening, everyone. Please rate us, review us where you find the show. Uh, have a great week and be safe out there. Bye bye. <laughs> Fruit beer and marshmallows rule. <laughs> there you go, man. <laughs>